So thank you, Cloda, and thank you to the All Ireland and Hospice Palliative Care for inviting me. It's really, really a great honour. Um, and I hope you do find this interesting. And I'm more than happy to, you know, um, answer any questions that you have. Um, and I hope it, it does. I, I, I hope my journey allows you to see that it it is. Um, it has been a journey. Um, it hasn't been a planned journey. I didn't go out with a, a complete map in my hand. Um, and I've sort of had my obstacles along the way. And hopefully you see that as well. And obst all obstacles can be overcome. So really called this um, From Seeds and Roots Come Beautiful Flowers. And that really shows that it was a tiny seed in clinical practice that started me along this journey. I would never have in all my times ever thought of ever doing a PhD. So hopefully it just lets you see where my, my topic has came from. So um, a brief synopsis of the presentation is, first of all, setting the scene in terms of palliative care and heart failure, looking at some of the challenges and opportunities in the integration of palliative care into heart failure, um, looking at which was for me a real clinical issue in terms of implantable defibrillator deactivation um, and how we are moving that into more guideline advice and really some next steps as well. So I'm starting this by some reflections on death. Sounds a bit sinister, but I thought some of them were quite interesting. In terms of a prolific writer called Isaac said, life is pleasant, death is peaceful, it's the transition that's troublesome. And that's where really palliative care sits. Um, Steve Jobs, you all know, um, co-founder of Apple said, no one wants to die, sure. And yet death is a destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it and that is how it should be because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. and clears out the old to make way for the new. So it's quite a philosophical way of looking at it. And then Woody Allen, the comedian said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. Something which I'm not sure he'll be able to do so. So in terms of the necessity of this session, we all know the importance of palliative care, but it's just to reinforce why in terms of heart failure and why it's so important. And it's so important in that it improves the quality of life for our patients and their families. And that's very often an area that we can forget within heart failure, that we're so focused on ensuring increased mortality that we can forget to ensure that we're making sure the patients have good quality of life as well. And that with that comes an improvement in their symptom burden. And the best provision of that is through a very interdisciplinary approach, um, ensuring that the disciplines work together. And it's not only just disciplines, but it's the patients involved and the family members involved, all to ensure that we're focused on one clear goal of improving quality of life. So in terms of palliative care and heart failure, this has been sitting around for years. So heart failure, we know, um, and the ones on this um, meeting are all very aware, it's associated with increased mortality, with complex and distressing symptoms, despite the medical pharmacological advancements, the device advancements, the surgical advancements. But it's recognized that even as far back as 20 years ago, that all patients with any chronic illness had really unmet palliative care needs. And that these vary depending on the type of chronic illness. And they started talking about these illness trajectories and how the illness trajectory should, should enable or shape the strategies and programs of care prior to death. So the first position paper in Europe for heart failure and palliative care was the 2009 HFA position paper or heart failure association position paper. And its aim at that time was simply raise awareness, improve accessibility, quality, develop and enhance availability of heart failure, palliative care services across Europe. So it really shows that this is like 11 years ago, we were actually just at the point of saying, what, you know, where is palliative care? Are we aware that it even exists and is it appropriate for our heart failure patients? So we've talked a bit about the changing face of heart failure trajectories and I thought this was interesting in that Murray in 2005, this was the first trajectory that came out and it was, I'm sure you're all very aware of it, the de de 
progressive decline with the dips indicating the hospitalizations where a patient really has decreased um, quality of life and really poor symptoms. And then it was made a bit more, um, bit more depth to it by putting in the importance of physical, social, psychological and spiritual symptoms in terms of how they interact along this trajectory. And then more recently in 2012, Alan produ produced this more complex trajectory looking at where palliative care should come in. And again, kept very much again to the end stages as you see here in terms of when there's really a progressive decline and you're really going into pump failure. So all along trying to map out where and when palliative care and heart failure um, paths should meet. So are we there yet? I'm sorry, I just had to put this in. It's one of the sayings immediately comes to mind is Shrek going, are we there yet? The donkey going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And I don't, I don't think we're anywhere near being there yet. This was um, the Atlas data from the HFA. So they literally asked 32 countries to um, investigate their heart failure provision. And they were only able to get um, a number of countries to respond on the availability of palliative care units for patients with advanced heart failure. And as you can see, unfortunately, Ireland's not included, but the United Kingdom is included in that they had only 3.8 um, palliative care units per million population. So really, we, we don't even have the resources there to ensure proper provision for these patients at the end of life. And what are the possible obstacles? And there's potentially could be lots more, but I'm just going to group them into three points. First one, uncertainty. There's the uncertainty of the prognosis. Heart failure is such a, a tricky, tricky condition to actually say this is now the patients in their final stages of the, the, um, their disease process. Many patients, and we're all aware of our, our heart failure patients have, and their family members, have often very unrealistic expectations of what of their length of life, unrealistic expectations of the interventions that they're about to undergo and what that intervention can provide for them. And this often takes away from actually identifying that they have dire symptoms which really would benefit from a palliative care approach. We're very, sometimes we're very, um, we struggle with introducing a palliative care dis discussion. We struggle about when we should refer them to the specialist palliative care. We struggle with actually how, how and when, with this continual fear that if we say it too soon, this would take away patients' hope. Certainly, as I've said, in terms of our, our multidisciplinary team, particularly at the current era of the COVID crisis, we have an adequate community community support. There's often insufficient advanced planning all along the journey. And there's sometimes ambiguity in who's coordinating what. Is it the GP? Is it the cardiologist? Is it if they're under a renal physician? Is it if they're a heart failure nurse? Is it the, you know, a case manager? Who's actually the coordinator in all this um, process? So to sort of start and unpick some of these, um, this is just a number of tools. So there's defined, definite tools out there to help us identify when patients should receive a palliative approach. And these are simply, um, these are um, presented in a recent heart failure document, which I'll explain later on. So these are well-renowned and validated tools, such as the Canvas City cardiomyopathies questionnaire and the supportive and palliative care indicators tools. So they're already tools which are out there, but often these tools aren't used within clinical practice. They're often used within that research era. Um, so even though they're there, we're not using them routinely to actually for the benefit of our patients. Moving on to the communication, this is something that has always stayed in my head in often Palliative care, end of life care, recognizing a progressive decline is often that elephant in the room. Um, and it's, it's you know, you, do you bring it up? Is it the right time? You struggle professionally in your own head whether you bring it up. 
So therefore, I can only relate to patients are recognising that their symptoms are getting worse, that they're not, for example, they've been started on a new medication and they're not having the response that the professional said they would, or they've been given a new device and they're not having this positive response that they were told they would. So often they have this in their head, it, what happens now, what's happening now? And this certainly can have a detrimental impact on their professional and per, professional and personal relationships in terms of their family. It can stall relationships in that they don't want to ask their cardiologist or their heart failure nurse, you know, why did this not happen or what's the next stage? And often they have um, limited access to, and that therefore makes them have limited access to very useful resources. And one that I can think of is just as simply being on a palliative care register will allow them additional even financial support. Um, and many, many patients, and this was from um, a qualitative piece that I did, actually fear that if they talk about it, it makes it reality. In that if they if they say the words out loud, all of a sudden, like, you know, as, as if you were a child, if you say the wrong thing, then all of a sudden it's there, it's out there, and we now have to deal with it. And unfortunately, even in the current era, palliative care is still remains associated with a cancer diagnosis and is only applicable really in the last stages of life. So this is very much evident in heart failure. And this was um, a survey which was carried out in Sweden in 2014 by the Swedish group. And they surveyed 111 heart failure nurses and asked them, what did they think about talking about end of life issues and palliative issues with their patients? And they said that it was very difficult because of the unpredictability of the trajectory of the heart failure. But more alarmingly, more than half said that it was difficult because they didn't have the time. Um, and that's, um, very difficult to hear and that often we don't make time for it. We often are concerned with their vital signs and getting them on the right medication and check on their renal function. Do we actually don't make time to talk to some of these patients and give them valuable information? So is there care support out there which are um, in terms of strategies of services out there which are, are have been researched and have been effective. And there has been three ways of delivering a service. We can deliver like a palliative care service by an inpatient, and that was proved to be very effective in America by Rogers in the PAL-HF um, randomized control trial. There was providing a palliative input when the patient is transitioning from the hospital into the community immediately during that 30 day golden period when they're when they leave hospital. And also the prefer study by Branstam, which is a Swedish study found that whenever there was um, care provided for patients at home, where it was very centered on their needs, um, and they had an individualized package that they certainly had better quality of life um, and better symptom management. So there's different mechanisms of delivery and often that is very much determined not only by the um, resources but also by the national healthcare structure and the way that the current service is. So there's different models out there which have been proven effective. So turning our attention then to, to my area which is implantable cardioverter defibrillators which are just a small implanted device. Um, they can be implanted solely, or they can be implanted, as you know, with a cardiac resynchronization therapy or, or a CRT device. An ICD, in basic terms, has three key, key functions, as I'm sure the ones here know. It can pace if the heart rate goes too slow. It can pace if the heart rate goes too fast, but its main function is to really deliver a small um, shock to the heart to stun it when a life-threatening arrhythmia occurs. And since 2002, 2003, the number of device implants in terms of ICDs and CRTs has escalated because of large clinical trials um, such as KHF, which have shown how important these um, devices are in um, preventing um, death 
um, and preventing death from a sudden cardiac death. And as a result, many of these patients perceive them as life-saving device. And sometimes that can happen because of the way that the device is portrayed whenever it's been implanted. Some of these patients have had either um, a, a, a life-threatening event happen and the device has been implanted and they've been sort of said, well, this device will prevent this from happening again. And they already retain security and safety knowing, well, if this, if I had another of these life-threatening events, this device will shock me, I will be fine. And sometimes, so therefore, it's portrayed as they're a life-saving event or a life-saving device, or even their insurance policy is the other mannerism. Um, the evidence would say that how professionals have encapsulated it at times. But in terms of deactivating it, why is it so challenging for us to discuss, let's deactivate the device? And deactivation is simply switching off the shock function. The other functions remain intact. Whenever I was looking at the evidence back in 2012, I noticed that a lot of the guidance are out there, but a lot of the guidance say consider discussing ICD deactivation. It doesn't say it explicitly. So sometimes professionals say, well, I am considering it and I'm thinking, I, I don't think it's appropriate at this time. So even the way the wording is done can sometimes leave us with a get out clause. Discussing it, discussing deactivation also is, can be very much determined by timing. Do we to discuss it when the device goes in? Do we discuss it when the device is re-implanted or when the ICD is being replaced? Do we discuss it during a routine consultation when the patient may bring up well, what happens when this battery goes? Or do we discuss it when the patient obviously is declining? Or do we leave it to end of life? And those were all points which were raised by um, uh, Lambert in 2010 in their guidance of these are typically the times you could discuss it and you should consider discussing it. It's, an, it's a topic which is very emotive. It's dealing with death and many cardiac patients really always remain optimistic about the length of life they have to leave, even though they have experienced very dire symptoms. And there's a lot of ethical and cultural concerns. And this was highlighted to me during a recent meeting I had about a year ago in terms of um, the colleagues in Cyprus and in Israel, in that they see the turning off of anything from it, um, from a, an ICD to a ventilator as um, nearly euthan not euthanasia, but literally legally not correct. So it's not only ethical, it can be legally not right to turn these things off because you've put something in place to keep this person alive. So legally, we're not allowing you to turn it off. And that's why a lot of them were, whenever we're getting into the COVID crisis, and this is how the discussions came out of how, how is this going to happen when legally they are not allowed to, to deactivate an ICD because um, it's against um, their their national law. So are patients actually getting shot? Is this something that we should be concerned about? And in 2014, which was an interesting study, where this lady explanted 125 devices from patients who had died. And she found that a third of them had received an arrhythmia in the last hour of life. So these patients had had a life-threatening arrhythmia in the last hour of life, and a third had received a shock. And if anybody realizes what a, a shot from an ICD is like, a shot from an ICD has been equated to being kicked in the chest by a horse. I'm sure you all know that. So it's not a pleasant experience. It's very distressing. And if you can imagine a third of these patients, or uh, a third of the 125 patients had received such an episode as they were dying. And that prompted me to um, look at just not the, a similar study, but look at a retrospective case note review of patients who had died with an ICD in the Belfast Trust. And I basically pulled charts from patients that I know that had an ICD over a 12 month period. And there's 59 patients. And out of that 59 patients, 10 had received a shock um, with four having received multiple shocks in the last few days of life. 
And certainly there was a significant correlation between the indications for the device and the shock received. So those patients who had had the device put in for secondary prevention or had the device put in because it had a prior um, life-threatening of event, they, the, they, were less, they were more likely to have received a shock. So this sort of made it very evident to me, we are doing some things, we are in the same place as where Sweden was in 2014. We have patients who are receiving shocks in the last few days of life when really the shock at this point should be inappropriate. So I've, I've spoken a bit about my sort of thoughts coming up. So where did this clinical issue come from? So my clinical issue came from a patient that I seen at Heart Feeder Clinic. And she was a lovely lady, she was 84. And um, we had struck up a relationship because I'd been managing her. Um, I had been seeing her every two weeks um, giving her metolazone, reducing her diuretic, reducing her ACE inhibitor, doing different medical treatments and seeing on a weekly basis because she had quite severe renal disease and there was a discussion about dialysis, which she said she was never going to have. She was refusing dialysis and she had the ability to say, I don't want dialysis and I'm not having it. However, she had a CRTD and she came to me with a letter at clinic saying I've received this letter and I have to come in for my device, a routine replacement of my device because the battery is declining. And I spoke to the consultant and the consultant said it's routine Lorena, she needs to come in, there's no debate. So even though this lady was, um, she had had previous history of breast cancer, was de had declined um, dialysis, so her EGFR was like 12, she had to come in for routine replacement of her device. To bring on a, a, a few months later, so the lady got the device in the June, come the September she was admitted with decompensated heart failure, come the October she wanted the device turned off because I by that stage was going why is this happening and we had had little bits of conversation all very illicitly, um, because at that point it was very much dodging the consultant. Um, and she was very much, but I don't want shocked, I want this deactivated. So she had the shock function deactivated. She then had the pacing function turned off because she felt the pacing function and she died in hospital two weeks later. So that lady in the June had already made up her mind what she wanted, but unfortunately at that time, there was nothing in place Within, within the trust to say, yes, we can honor this lady's decision. So from that, I, I applied and got a PhD from the R&D Fellowship, which is the public um, monies within Northern Ireland. I looked at it, just a completed a systematic review of the literature to improve my own knowledge on what is the state of play. I've alluded to doing the, the case note review, a very simple case note review of what's happening where I work, what's the current state of play, where I work. And from that then I also did a more international um, survey of professionals in terms of what their attitudes are towards deactivation and that was really quite enlightening too in terms of when they would be, um, when they would um, feel more likely to start a conversation or when they would feel comfortable and confident starting a conversation. And that was being published and then I'm a, I was about to start my feasibility study um, unfortunately this year so that has been put on hold just developing an, an intervention for these patients in terms of um, decision making and knowledge and that hopefully will lead into a randomized control trial so following that MRC framework of explore to work leading into a trial at some point and certainly what has always embedded in me is some of the patients that I interviewed and even just to speak to them not from not just listening to that patient in clinical practice but listening to them through just the interviews and it was quite these were very switched on patients but they just hadn't received the information unfortunately so some of them were for example um like the one in an orange going another shock when I'm going to die anyway I don't want to be rushed up to the royal and kept there for days on the machine 
And there was a young lady I remember was she was in her forties, and she equated it to a ventilator in that you know she wanted to be able to make a choice of when she you know when she could turn it off. So some of them had already started to make connections, but didn't know their ability to make decisions. So how did what happened after that? So um, to cut a long story short. Um, back in 2007, there was regional subgroups for palliative care um, instigated by the board. And um, one was instigated or started off by John Purvis in the Western Trust. And it was all heart feeder nurses and all um, heart feeder consultants got together to discuss a pathway for our heart feeder patients. And during one of the meetings, it was brought up about um, palliative you know, what happens when these patients are dying? Surely we should be providing something a bit more for that. And I remember it was um, myself and a girl, Veronica, Veronica Keys, who then moved to Australia, brought it up. And at that point, the patient in it, um, who, the patient that was sitting on the subgroup as patient representative went, no, you're not putting us in the scrap heap. You're not starting up a, 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 a group to look at our palliative care needs. So at that stage, there was a, just back in 2008, there was already a lot of resistance from patients. But we were tasked to chair this, what we renamed as Supportive and Palliative Care Heart Feeder Subgroup in 2008. And from that, we developed symptom control guidelines for patients with heart failure in 2010. And those could only be branded for heart failure nurses. They couldn't go out to the public. They couldn't go to, to be used by GPs or anything just for heart failure nurses. So from that, then, as I say, I did my PhD. I did the retrospective case note review, which was presented to the um, clinicians. And it was quite daunting because at the same time as presenting it, I was taking responsibility as well because I was a heart failure nurse that looked after a lot of these patients. And I was sort of saying, you know, I have not stepped up to the mark here either. I then got involved with um, the Karen Together program with Yvonne Melrick and Karen Hogg. And seeing at that point, did that program, could that be transferred over to Northern Ireland? And there was a lot of really good components in it, but it just wasn't transferable. It just, we didn't have that, that team that they had very much in, in Scotland at that time. Um, then there was other opportunities come up in terms of the Project ECHO team in terms of the um, Early Career Research Forum um, by the All-Ireland um, Institute. There was involvement with the British Heart Foundation and the Northern Ireland Chest Heart and Stroke. So already sort of trying to navigate my way through all these and see who could help me um, sort of bring this more to the fore. I then did some more international network in that I joined the ACNAP or the nurses part of the European Society of Cardiology back in 2013 and sort of worked at that and really seizing every opportunity um, to, to um, try and make this more focal. So in 2019, the BHF said that they wanted to produce these guidance and these literally sat so well with the guidance that we had already produced in 2010. Um, and at that point in 2010, I didn't have the courage to present my work, but at this time I did. I made sure ICD deactivation went into this booklet and that it was clear that it had to be discussed um, and how the professionals could give them just providing some um, very constructive way of how they could go about um, making sure that it was facilitated. And there's different routes along the way. I've had the different, you know, so many people have sort of helped profile um, and help support uh, um, this in terms of the importance of palliative care and heart failure. There's the Palliative Care Research Network. There's been a committee on the Irish Nurses Cardiovascular Association. I've become now, from working with the ACNAP, I've now been elected onto as an executive board member for the Heart Failure Association of the ESC. And I've been um, appointed chair last year and again this year of their palliative care task force to really ensure that not only is palliative care an uh, important remit within Northern Ireland, but also um, more, more internationally. 
So this is just where my idea of roots came from. And this is just um, letting you see that I, I did have a plan in my head where this presentation was. Um, I, I also am a member of the ESC Task Force for Allied Professionals. So really showing that it's not just nurses and cardiologists, it's also the importance of cardiac physiologists, that they have a role to play, the importance of pharmacists, because so many of them are doing clinics nowadays, and that we all have a role to play in this interdisciplinary approach in the provision of palliative care. Um, and there's loads of colleagues, collaborators, friends, mentors that I've met along the way, um, particularly Professor Fitzsimons, Donna and um, Sonia, who have really sort of kept navigating me in the way to go and encouraging me as I've went along. And this is just a recent publication. So from the palliative care um, task force that the Heart Failure Association um, set up a number of years ago, but eventually we've now just had our most recent position paper published, really showing how palliative care should be integrated throughout the heart failure trajectory, how we should be providing a, um, some sort of palliative support through that chronic care phase, through that crisis care when they're admitted to hospital and have decompensated, and also through that terminal care, which unfortunately all along palliative care has always just sat. So basically extending it out um, to, to encompass a lot more of the heart failure management. And this is just the abstract from that showing the importance that all, all along throughout the trajectory, we need to be supporting patients. We need to be providing them with information. We need to be communicating with them no matter how difficult. And we need to be allowing them to make those shared decisions. And though that can only be achieved whenever they have the um, appropriate information. So in summary, um, palliative care, it does continue to be the Cinderella of heart failure management. It does continue to be sort of often sweeped along and then below the carpet. But I do think that it is becoming a bit more recognised of, of important, um, particularly a lot of our advanced therapies in terms of LVADs and, um, you know, they're beginning to recognise the importance of making sure that this is given as much emphasis as a referral to an the patient to an advanced um, clinic for an LVAD. Certainly there needs to be more research looking at what model works within your remit and your country, which components can you transfer over and who's the best person to be delivered, to be delivering that to make it the most effective. And all along, patients and family members should really remain um, involved to make sure that they're allowing that service, which is in the infancy, to be developed into something which is sustainable for long term.